Hello, uh, good morning to the first session of um, March for the DBA Fundamentals virtual chapter. Uh, my name is Steve Cantrell uh, along with um, Shane O'Neill and today we have Tim Radney uh, from SQL Skills with Common SQL Server Mistakes. I'm going to take care of a few housekeeping things first. Okay. Our sponsor, um, Century One, provides all of the resources that allows us to bring these sessions to you. So, um, and prize money and and other prizes. So, please give them a tryout. Uh, go to their website. There's tons of free articles, videos, downloads. Uh, Plan Explorer is fantastic for. Um, um, for uh, troubleshooting, uh, it's free. This is the professional version. Give it a try. You can send in and ask questions about SQL performance on your system. And if you're using Plan Explorer, you can send in specific queries that look really bad, and they'll give you and, and it, it'll randomize and and uh, it, it will mask production data so you can actually send stuff in and let people look at it uh, and they'll give you suggestions so anyway it's a great opportunity make use of that uh, when you can uh, we're speaking of prizes and giveaways uh, through the first half of the year we're giving away eighteen hundred dollars which everything that we had instead of giving it out per session we're doing it in three things uh, because it's easier with us with all the sessions that we give um, to divide it up that way. Um, if you are a member of PASS, you're eligible. If you follow us on Twitter, you're eligible. And if you subscribe to our YouTube account, uh, dbafundtube.org, um, you're eligible. And then you get one entry for each session attended through June the 30th. And first prize will be a $1,000 Amazon gift card, uh, second, $500, and third, $300. Here's some of our sessions coming up. Um, next week, we'll have Brent Ozar with what to do when SQL Server is slow. Um, then we've got Paul Randall, Thomas LeBlanc with execution plans, uh, Kendra Little with index design patterns for beginners. Uh, then Jess Borland, um, let me back up, and Tim just said that he may have a session uh, that we can uh, present for him in June or July. So, PASS has multiple virtual groups, multiple languages, multiple topics and sessions, so give that a shot and go check it out. Here's some of the sessions that others are giving. Um, the Women in Technology uh, virtual group is giving a session a week uh, this month, so go over to their site and check that out. Uh, they've got one today, right after us. And um, let's see, we've got two more actually. We've got a, a, a session down under, and then we've got the one with Brent. And then the Women in Technology chapter is giving another session with Karen Delaney, Kaylin, Kaylin Delaney. Uh, SQL Saturday Night SQL's got always got some good sessions going. And then there's Women in Technology again. Anyway, SQL Saturdays. If you've never been to a SQL Saturday, you need to give that a shot too. Uh, you can go to SQLSaturday.com and see what the closest one is to you. Uh, they're like many, many past summits, free education. You go listen. Vendors pretty well sponsor and pay for everything. You pay for your own lunch, and other than that, you just have a day of learning and networking. It's a great opportunity, so try that out. Here's some of the sessions coming up. Um, we will be recording this session. Uh, it'll be available at dbafundtube.org or dbafund.org. Uh, usually with one to two days. Um, I'm going to turn the session over to Tim. Just a second here. Let me make Tim the presenter. Shane. 
should be coming your way, Tim. All right, I just shared, so you should be seeing the intro slide. Looks good to me. All right, so we'll get started. Uh, this is the Common SQL Server Mistakes and How to Avoid Them session. Uh, this session kind of came to be from one of my first ever blog posts on inheriting a neglected database. And it kind of became a, a session and has evolved over time. Uh, in the beginning, I thought that, you know, hey, maybe it was just the company I was working at that you know, we didn't do a lot of uh, things that I came to learn as a DBA and being involved in you know, the, uh, the past community and reading uh, blog posts and things and you know, kind of learning and growing as a DBA. I thought, hey, it, it's probably just us. And then once I started consulting, I realized, you know, hey, these are, are extremely common. So I started kind of expanding my list, and uh, that's what you're going to get to see today is you know, most uh, are in a lot of the the things that I just uh, find clients not doing just because it, it's things that uh, you're not prompted to, to fix. And if you don't know about it, then you just don't know about it. So we're trying to spread the word. So we'll get started. So I am with SQL Skills. I get to work with some really awesome people like Paul Randall, Kimberly Tripp, Glenn Berry, Aaron Stellato, and Jonathan Cahayas. We do a lot of instructor-led training known as our immersion events. Those are where you, uh, you come on site somewhere. A lot of uh, training online at Portal Site. Everything from consulting, remote DBA, uh, we speak at various conferences, and you can subscribe to our newsletter. It's not a markety spammy kind of newsletter. It actually contains insider videos and a, a lot of quick how-tos. I mentioned the in-person training classes uh, were for 2018 we will be in Chicago, uh, Bellevue and London. I'm really excited to get to go out to London and teach about Azure. You see our list of uh, training classes that we offer. Uh, you can find out more at sqlskills.com training and uh, our consulting aspects as well. Speaking of conferences, uh, this is a past session. I wanted to let you know there are is a uh, Conference coming up at the end of this month in uh, Disney World. We'll be at the Walt Disney World Swan Resort. This is the SQL Intersection Conference. We have a lot of workshops, a lot of general sessions. Uh, it is a very fun conference. So if you're in the market to attend some training uh, in the next couple of weeks, come see us down at SQL Intersection in Orlando. For Pluralsight, um, if you email Paul at sqlskills.com, Put sub and the subject line user group plural site code. He'll send you a code good for 30 days of all SQL Skills content. Uh, we have like 60 courses out there, over 175 hours of content. Uh, so you can definitely get your learn on at plural site. My vanity slide, the takeaways here are uh, my email address, blogs, and I'm, uh, can you uh, mute? Picking a lot of feed. All right, so takeaways here, blogs, email addresses, and Twitter. Uh, if you have any questions or you want to connect, feel free to reach out either uh, through Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, any of those social medias. So today, what are we going to be, what am I going to be covering? <clears throat> well, foremost, the most important thing to me is backups. If you don't have a proper recovery strategy planned and have backups to meet that recovery plan, when that oops situation occurs, then you're in really bad shape. So we're gonna cover that. We're gonna talk about consistency checks, log cleanups, statistics, index maintenance, your memory settings, max degree of parallelism and cost threshold for parallelism. We'll talk about TempDB, some free monitoring with SQL Server alerts, and lastly, power savings. So with backups, why is this important? Well. If you have an, one of those oops situations and you need to be able to recover data, if you can't recover that data, uh, we refer to that as a uh, CLM, a career limiting move. And being in the consulting space, it's very kind of unfortunate and sad that you know, part of our, our, our role is people reach out to us after a disaster has happened asking, can we help? And in many situations, if they do not have proper backups that they can recover from, and they're past a point of um, 
you know, re recovery, then the, the answer is in many times, no. I mean, your database has become corrupt, it's unreadable, you don't have proper backups, that was the only copy of your data. There, there's nothing more we can, can really do. And, you know, there are Hail Marys, but for the most part, uh, you're, you're just in bad shape. So we preach, you've got to have you know, backups that enable you to meet your uh, service level agreements for recovery. So you need to plan a restore strategy to meet your service level agreements. And so what are service level agreements? Your recovery point objective, meaning how recent do you need to be able to restore to and your recovery time objective, you know, basically how long can you, can you be down? So how much data can you afford to lose and how long can you be down? If you ask your business units those questions, they're likely to say no data loss and no downtime, which is almost impossible to reach. But in the real world, I mean, for full disaster, your data center is becoming smoking hole in the ground. You're looking at four hours up to a day. And, you know, the data loss, you know, five minutes, 10, 15, I mean, somewhere around in that range, uh, pretty well standard. And so your transaction log level backups during that time you know, it is pretty uh, easy to meet those service level agreements, but you have to establish those. Don't just assume them when you take over a system. You know, validate, you know, trust, but verify uh, you know, what, what settings are in place today are actually and truly needed. I like to, to share a story where there was a system I inherited that had over uh, 4,000 production databases, and it was deemed as a tier one system, meaning we had four hour, uh, recovery time objective and uh, 15 minutes recovery point objective for 4,000 databases. I met with a business unit and just asked a, a few questions. And those questions were pretty simple. If the system were to die, you know, it, it goes away. How long before we're taking financial loss or, you know, it's a, a major impact to the organization? It's like three days. Wow, three days and we have a four hour SLA. All right, um, another question. If I were to lose your data, you know, database becomes unavailable at 12 noon, and I can only restore you back to midnight last night, what does that do to your department? Oh, nothing. We'll just reprocess the work that we did. Uh, we do that by ingesting files. <laughs> so, okay, so you really don't even need log backup every 15 minutes. I could do differentials every four hours and you would be ecstatic. And yes. So able to go and change the, um, the recovery strategy for this database and then come to find out out of those 4,000 databases, only about 40 of them were actual read-write. The rest were archive copies where it was like monthly snapshots of this data. So those I could switch to simple recovery. Whereas in the beginning, everything was full recovery. So again, that's a, a wonderful edge case example, but I have hundreds of examples very similar <clears throat> where databases are in improper recovery models. Like I find a mission critical production OLTP database. It's in simple that needed to be in full. So you want to make sure you have proper recovery models and that you're getting the proper level backups for those databases that can meet your recovery strategy. Paul has a great example where it was a solid backup strategy, but when they tried to recover, it took like four days to recover a database and that business didn't survive an outage. So make sure that your recovery strategy meets those service level agreements. And then the other thing is validating that your backups are good. <clears throat> the time to, to, to figure out that your backups are bad or that you can't recover from them is, is not during a production outage where you're dependent upon them. So you need to regularly test your backups. And if you're in a regulated industry like finance, uh, security, uh, or like some security and exchange, um, insurance, anything that has heavy regulation, auditors and examiners love to see your restore validation process. And it's very simple to spin up a virtual machine, throw in a little bit of logic, and have a system that's regularly going through and restoring your databases from their uh, production backup locations. When you're doing that, you can build reports from MSDB on you know, the, the restore process, how long it took, uh, whether it was successful, you can even build in some uh, you know, queries to go through and you know, validate that the data is actually there and, and consistent. Uh, you can run check DBs against them. I mean, a lot of benefits having this restore validation process. But one of the main things is, you know, our databases grow over time. So even though you may be able to meet your SLA for uh, how quickly you can restore the database, 
as time progresses, that database grows, you know, what happens to your restore times? You know, they're going to grow too. So by being able to tell and, and validate the length of time it takes to restore a database and automated process against uh, maybe a configuration table of what the SLAs are, you can start seeing where you're getting close to that uh, service level agreement <clears throat> where you may not be able to meet it if something were to happen. But the biggest benefit of backup validation is knowing your backups are good, knowing that when you go to sleep at night, if something were to, to go bump in the night and you have to restore, you, you know what you're doing. You know, you're not having to go and uh, do a Google Bing search to figure out how you know what the restore statement is to recover a full, a differential, and you know logs throughout that day. You know it, you know what you're doing. You just execute your plan. And I have a script that's available timradney.com forward slash backups. This script brings back the database name, recovery model, when the last full was done, the last differential if you have them, and your last two transaction logs. So I like this because I can look at that script and be able to quickly. Uh, gather whether you have databases in you know, full recovery with no log backups, whether uh, what your log interval is. So if I'm looking at logs in there every four hours, I know you have a four hour potential data loss. You, um, I can tell whether you're doing you know, differentials or, I mean, it, it's it, it's a good script. It's a great starting point to look and see you know, wh what your backups are, what your intervals are. And you can modify that script to include backup paths and, and different things if you want. And, on my blog post, people have posted variations of the script that uh, they took the the core and and added to it to make it work for them for their need. But for me, the script as is provides the data I need when I'm doing some consulting. So have fun with it, and uh, I hope that your backups are are all in great shape. Next thing is consistency checks. So this is kind of the last gloom and doom. Um, slide and con you know, consistency checks what we're doing or what this is for is checking for uh, corruption and 99.98 percent of the time that corruption is or, or or occurs is due to an io subsystem problem that means less than you know one percent or 0.1 percent is local hardware or a sql server bug i haven't seen uh, i want to say it was maybe 2012 that had a, a bug in an AG that could potentially corrupt and that was quickly fixed. And that's been the, the last time I'm really aware of a, a situation within SQL Server itself that could lead to corruption. Again, over 99% is some IO subsystem problem. And so that means it's not really a matter of if corruption is going to occur, it's a matter of when it's going to occur in your system. So we need to be checking for corruption on a regular basis instead of waiting for a user to hit the corrupt portion of the database and it generate an error because it could take days, weeks, or even years, depending on where that data is before it may be accessed and, and generate um, a, a, an error. So running DBCC check to be on a regular basis, how often should you be running it? Well, that depends how much data can you afford to lose. I like to see it no less than once a week. I have some clients that their databases are small, their IOS systems are fast, they run check to be on a, on a daily basis. Some can argue that that's overkill, but on a weekly basis, but the, the main thing is that you're running it regularly enough that when corruption occurs, that you have proper backup retention that you can go back prior to the corruption and be able to get your data back. So running check DB, you can also check just your allocation tables. You can run check DB against just the catalog, individual file groups. That's fantastic. If you have large partition databases, you can run check DB against your read write. Um, so when corruption occurs, kind of what's the step? Well, many times you have to restore from backup, depending on the level of corruption. And if you get lucky, it's corruption in a non-clustered index. You can drop and recreate the index. You can run check to be with uh, repair, rebuild. Uh, what you really uh, don't want to see is the recommendation to run check to be repair, allow data loss, because that means exactly what it says. It's going to attempt to correct, uh, correct the error in the database by deleting the range of data that's corrupt. So. When that happens, you will have data loss. So depending on where that was, if it was your heap or your clustered index, well, that's your actual data. So that's that's bad bad news. Uh, so takeaway here: make sure that you're running CheckDB. It is I/O intensive, so you want to run it during maintenance windows. Um, organizations that have 
large numbers of databases, large numbers of instances. Um, when you go to, to run CheckDB, if you try to standardize your SQL Server uh, installs and your scripts and your jobs, be cognizant of if your default job is to run CheckDB at 2 a.m. and you run that script on every production database, you're going to run CheckDB on all databases starting at 2 a.m. That's kind of unkind to your storage admins. So do try to stagger on your systems when this runs so that you're not melting your, your storage arrays. All right, next slide, purging logs. So this one's fun. MSDB stores all your backup and restore history. And what I, what I find is if people are not running like the Ola Halligren maintenance process or third-party tools that take into account your backup history in MSDB, if they've rolled their own solution, they're not really aware that they need to be running SP underscore delete underscore backup history. And MSDB just continues to grow and grow and grow. And they have all the metadata related to backups from the backup media set, where it went, how long it took, whether compression was used, you know, all of those you know, bits of data. And they have it for the life of the server. And that causes MSDB to bloat. And it's there's really no benefit there. Now, some organizations do query MSDB for reporting on backups when they uh, took place and so forth. But again, 30 days worth of history, 90 days worth of history is pretty sufficient. You know, you're running those reports, archive those reports somewhere else, and make sure that you're pruning MSDB backup history. Very simple. You can throw this in a SQL agent job where you can declare a date parameter, set uh, that parameter to get date minus 90, to pass that parameter to the SP underscore delete underscore backup history uh, stored procedure, and let it run on a daily basis, and it will keep things clean. Now, there are a lot of other places within MSDB that can bloat from uh, you know, SysMail, uh, DBmail, uh, Service Broker. I mean, there, there's a lot you know, of things out there. I have a SQL performance article that goes into details about uh, pruning MSDB. And the community came out in force and people posting additional areas that I didn't cover in the, the post to say, oh, well, this one got me on this and your log shipping history. I mean, lots of things um, utilize MSDB. So that article is pretty consistent uh, now with all the areas that you can check. But backup history is the most common that I come across. Also, the SQL Server log. So by default, your SQL Server error log only rolls over at a service restart. Now, I have some systems that I manage that SQL Server service has not been restarted in a year, year and a half. I think that's remarkable that a Windows server it has been up for that long. Um, they tend to need to be patched on a regular basis. So that's a different conversation I have with that client. But again, the server's been up for a long time. That means that log, if it's not being manually reset or rolled over, is going to have a year and a half worth of history in it. So when you go to try to look at the log, it has to read that flat file. And it takes a long time to go through and read that entire file and then load it so that I can look at it. Well, if it has a lot of noise in it, I want to apply a filter. And I want to filter based upon an error or something within uh, some keyword. So I have to apply that filter and then wait for it to sort and go through that entire um, you know, flat file. And that can take, take a long time. So a, kind of a better thing to do is to manually cycle that error log by having a SQL agent job. You execute sp underscore cycle underscore error log, starts a new log. Have it run at midnight. So every day you get a brand new log. It's not invasive to the system. It's uh, almost a non-event. Uh, the kind of takeaway here or thing to consider is by default, you have six rollover logs in your active logs. So you have seven files. So if you're resetting this on a daily basis, you now have six plus that day of logs. And that's really not enough history to go back. So you want to go into the properties of the SQL Server error log and change that to some other number. So increase from six to another number, goes up to 99, 30, 35 is a good uh, number. So if you set 35 and you know, your server reboots a couple of times because somebody's trying to troubleshoot something and they're just restarting the service over and over, then you, you still got close to, to 30 days worth of history to go back. And you're really not gonna find that you're, you're wanting to go back more than 30 days to log you know, that often. If you are, that's something that you probably need to be using some log analytics. There's an Azure service for that. There's Log Logic, Sumo Logic, Splunk, other systems that could be slurping up those 
those logs and storing them in, a, in another system. Or you can go all the way out to 99. So at least 30 days for troubleshooting is uh, kind of the standard. All right, now let's start talking about some performance related things. Uh, statistics. I find that unless the, the customer or the, the client that is very active in the, the SQL Server community or following uh, blog posts, you know, checking out Pluralsight, you know, the continuing education. Many of the, the clients I work with, they're accidental DBAs at best, uh, you know, developers that also are responsible for the instance or um, or you know, could be DBAs that haven't you know, gotten into, well, more, I still have to stick with, most are like database developer or application developer, sys engineer types that I tend to work with. <clears throat> so they don't know about statistics or they've read about statistics, but don't understand that the update statistics really isn't the, the, the best mechanism out there for keeping your statistics up to date. And the reason being is that by default, it's, 20% plus 500 rows of data have changed. All data sets that are somewhat active, maybe that works, but when I'm in front of an audience and I ask the audience, how many of you have a table with more than a million rows? Of course, every hand goes up. Okay, uh, next question, out of that million rows, how many um, uh, systems is that million rows, five years of data or more? And again, every hand goes up. So we say, all right, well, you have a million rows and it's five years worth of data. So, you know, 200,000 rows is a year worth of data. So a full, that's 20%. So a full year of data has to be modified plus 500 rows before statistics would be updated. Yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of crass to, you know, example, but it, it's kind of reality. So I don't want to be making decisions today on fact or data that, only had from a year ago. I mean, that things change, uh, trends change, styles change. So I want my statistics to be as up to date as possible so that the query optimizer can make the best uh, decision possible for generating the execution plan. So we need a, a process to update these statistics manually. Now, if you're rebuilding all your indexes every single day, well, index rebuilds are going to update statistics. Index reorganizations are not. Um, so if you're rebuilding all your indexes on a weekly basis, okay, that's overkill for index rebuilds. Um, I see that with database, database maintenance plans, you know, rebuild every index, whether it needs it or not on Sunday. Well, that's also updating statistics. So cool side benefit. Uh, those who are doing uh, index maintenance based upon fragmentation levels, doing more reorgs than rebuilds. Well, this is very crucial because the re reorganizations don't update statistics. So you need a, a process in place. So you can roll your own using SP underscore update stats and telling it you know, uh, the, the, your sample rates or full scan or, or however you want to, to do that. Uh, Ola Halligren, his index optimized procedure also includes some parameters for updating statistics. So that's what I recommend for my clients. It works very well. And again, the benefit and the reason you know, very important if your optimizer uses the statistics to build the execution plan. Out-of-date stats means that the query optimizer is likely not going to make the best decision with generating the execution plan, so it's not going to be the, the best good enough plan. You, it could be one that's not using a particular index, it could be a, a bad sample rate, and you get some erratic behavior, high CPU, table scans. Um, so up-to-date stats, very, very important and very simple to fix. I mean, I've had a number of clients that when they reach out and I, I go through and do our, our normal audit and I report back that they're not doing proper index maintenance and they run the index optimized procedure, take care of fragmentation and update statistics that I get an email the next day saying that they received overwhelming response from their users wanting to know what they did to the system, what upgrade they put in place because the, the screens are just lightning fast between their application I mean, a orders of magnitude improvement of their system with a very simple change of you know, updating statistics and taking care of fragmentation. So it's it's a real thing. So mentioned statistics, so, uh, excuse me, fragmentation. So what causes fragmentation within the database? 
you know, simple things like inserts, updates, deletes. Hopefully you have a lot of that going on, meaning that your databases are busy, that your businesses are out uh, making money, uh, selling more widgets and, and various things, and that business is good. So it's a normal wear and tear, you know, friction within the database. So the normal wear, Microsoft back in the SQL Server 2000 days put out a white paper. They really wanted to understand you know, what the impact of fragmentation was to uh, the performance of a, of a system. And what they found was anywhere from 13 to 460% based on the size of the environment and the level of fragmentation. Now that, that's kind of big and given, I mean, this was in the SQL Server 2000 days on spinning disk, but 460% and even that low number, 13%, 13% seems like a number compared to 460%. But let's put 13% in perspective. Would you like a 10% raise? Why, yes, that would be a phenomenal raise to, to receive, right? So what about a 13% improvement in performance of a system? I mean, I know of companies that have spent millions of dollars to gain you know, single-digit performance improvements on network, you know, storage latencies, you know, various things. And you can get you know, 13% up to 460% just taking care of fragmentation. So fragmentation in a database, what are some negative impacts of this? Well, one, your data is kind of uh, not as, as logically ordered as, as possible, but the, the biggest thing is that wasted space within the pages that is also read into the buffer pool. So a lot of wasted space in the buffer pool, which is memory. We tend to have a whole lot more storage than we have memory. And that memory, if it's being wasted, I mean, that's less data we can store in the buffer pool. That means we're going back to those, uh, to the hard drives, to the disk, to read data more frequently than we you know, really would have to. So there's multiple benefits of trying to eliminate the fragmentation. And how do we do it? I mean, uh, we've talked about the, the statistics with SP underscore update stats, with uh, fragmentation, we control it by rebuilding, reorganizing, or you can disable and rebuild an index. You can schedule rebuilds or reorganizations within a database maintenance plan. And I say this is for 2000 or for versions of SQL Server under or less than 2016. With SQL Server 2016, you can now schedule um, reorganization or rebuilds based upon fragmentation levels. But SQL Server 2014 and below, you could choose to rebuild everything or reorganize everything. There wasn't a whole lot of logic uh, outside of that. Uh, custom scripts within a SQL agent job, such as Ola Halligren's index optimized script, and there's third-party tools out there. Now, I like some of the third-party tools because they also include like um, charts and graphs and different things. And if you work for an organization where you have to produce uh, TPS reports, and you're saying how busy you are and what your team is doing, having this kind of data uh, to say, oh, we had to rebuild X numbers of indexes, and we had to reorganize X number of indexes, you know, on a uh, within the, the the past seven days. You know, that data is also logged within Ola Halligren's index optimized. But the third-party tools, you know, can have charts and graphs, and may make it easier because you don't have to query the data directly. But we're data folks; we can query. So by having that data logged, you can report you know, how how busy you are, right? Well. Having that data also means that you can look to see if you're rebuilding indexes once fragmentation gets over a certain percent and you're reorganizing where it's between, say, 5% and 30%. And you're doing this on a weekly basis and you're consistently seeing that you're having to rebuild certain indexes every single week because they become over a certain level of threshold of fragmentation. You may want to look at that index and see you know, why is it a hotspot? What's going on? Do we have the right fill factor? Do we have the right clustered key column? You know, why is it becoming so fragmented? And it could just be that it's a, a dump table where the data is you know, truncated and new data coming in and it's just a trash table to begin with and fragmentation really doesn't matter based on the nature of the, the data. Or it could be that it's a very, very important data uh, table or index and truly do need to look at you know, fill factors and uh, the proper clustered key columns and make sure that um, that the table is properly optimized. So good data that you can noodle on and try to learn more about your systems. That's really getting into some of the, the fine tuning. But you can also you know roll your own uh, charts and graphs because you know we know that C level executives love 
you know, charts and graphs. So you can do your pie charts, bubble charts, line graphs with that data set on numbers of databases per tables and fragmentations and uh, make it look like you're extremely busy. But fragmentation, yes, it's still a thing. Uh, there's uh, some out there that have uh, thrown some data out saying if you have solid state hard drives, you know, you don't need to worry about fragmentation. Well, the, the, in those cases, the disks are so fast that yes, it kind of masks things, but I've yet to come across a client that has more RAM than storage, where say they have a terabyte of RAM and a 500 gig database and a terabyte SSD to where the whole database can be in memory. In those cases, okay, you, you've masked problems. What I tend to come across is a database that, or an instance that may have 128 gig of RAM, a terabyte database, and you know, a little you know, more than a terabyte <clears throat> worth of storage, where even if it's still an SSD, um, multi-terabyte SSD with a terabyte uh, database and 128 gig of RAM, wasted buffer full space is still wasted buffer full space, and that's a, a prime commodity. So I, I'm still going to recommend that you take care of fragmentation. And my colleague, Jonathan Cahayas, has a uh, SQL performance article on that exact um, situation. All right, other defaults. So I had mentioned the statistics. We do have the auto update statistics that's in place that attempts to help. There is no auto I mean, fragmentation handler and other defaults. The default for memory usage is kind of, uh, kind of far out there. Your max server memory value is set to a very large number that equals two petabytes. It's hard to find a large client that has a petabyte of storage, much less a petabyte of RAM, or even come close to two petabytes of RAM. So that's a very large number, and your minimum memory set to zero. So what this does is set SQL Server up to starve the operating system, and the operating system to starve SQL Server. So SQL Server will just continue to, to grab as much memory as, as possible, and it can starve the OS. The OS needs to uh, do some work. It has to ask for memory. SQL Server has to back off some, free it up. The OS will complete its task. It's a nice neighbor. It releases that memory. SQL Server will grab it back up, and it creates this perpetual bad situation. In SQL Server 2008 R2 and below, your max memory applied to the buffer pool only. With 2012 and up, it's still set to two petabytes for the max memory, zero for minimum. There was a complete memory manager redesign, so now the max memory applies to all memory manager allocations. Now there, there are some folks that say with 2012 and up, you can you know, leave the defaults and let SQL Server dynamically manage memory. I've asked a few of my uh, friends up at Microsoft that you know, work on various teams on, and the question on 2012 and above, do you still set max server memory? And they said, absolutely. And I said, well, why if we can con consider letting SQL Server dynamically manage the memory? And they're like, well, just in case. So <laughs> I do the same thing. So just in case on all instances, I still set max server memory and I will kind of fine tune it over time. And Jonathan Cahayas has a blog post out there, how much memory does SQL Server need? And this is not the definitive, absolutely, this is the value, never change it. It's a fantastic starting point. So he has an algorithm based upon the, the amount of memory, how much to give to SQL Server, how much to give to the OS, and then encourages you to monitor the M bytes available perfmon counter to see how much memory is still available. And over time, you can increase that up or back off max server memory to make sure that operating system still has what it needs, but that SQL Server can use as much as possible without you know, killing or starving the OS. All right, other uh, default settings. So max degree of parallelism. Max degree of parallelism by default is set to zero. That means an unlimited number of CPUs could be used to execute the parallel region of a query. And that unlimited is really not unlimited. It's up to 64 unless you put in a trace flag that allows it to use more. But I don't find uh, too many customers with more than 64 uh, logical processors to, to worry about. So still 64 is a very large number. So the recommendation here is if you have more than eight CPUs, start with eight and modify from there. If you have eight or fewer, you can use zero up to N, N being the, the number of logical processors or logical cores. So a, a common question comes up. All right, on virtual machines, do you still need to set this? 
Well, is, are there more than eight vCPUs? If there are, I tend to still set it, and I do try to look at you know how those CPUs are allocated to the virtual machine to make a, a more wise decision. But most VMs that I work with have anywhere from two, four, you know, six, eight vCPUs. And in that case, the zero to N applies. So if I have four vCPUs, do I set it to four or do I leave it to zero? Well, four still fits within the recommendation, but zero by default equals four. So on VMs with low numbers of vCPUs, you can leave it to the default or you can set it if you're concerned with your, your client or someone increasing uh, the number of, of, um, of virtual cores on that host, or excuse me, on that guest. Physical machines, yes, I, this is where I, I dig in. There's a Microsoft support article that does, I believe that article does get into some of the NUMA configurations. So one of the things I like to try to do is if I have a machine that has you know, 12 CPUs, but they're six core processors, I'll set maxed up to six to try to you know, keep things within the NUMA nodes. Another is your cost threshold for parallelism. And to me, this one is um, quite important because this determines it, it, this, the query subtree cost is your cost threshold for parallelism. So the arbitrary value of how expensive that query is. So the current default is five. Five used to mean five seconds back in like the SQL Server 70-2000 days. Now it's just an arbitrary value. It's a unit of measurement and five is, is way too low. Um, so the recommendation now is you need to increase the value of the cost threshold for parallelism to a higher number. And we at SQL Skills tend to recommend anywhere from 25 to 50 based upon your environment. Uh, again, Kahias, I guess he could not sleep you know, one evening and just went through and wrote this very awesome uh, article about how to go through and dig through the plan cache to find which queries are executing parallel and what their cost threshold values are. And you can take that data and look and see you know, one is there a big grouping, you know, you, there's this huge group of uh, uh, queries that are executing, their cost threshold is 35, and I start looking at those queries, and yeah, you know, I might be able to optimize a few of them, so I do, but you know, the other ones, you know, not so much, and when I pass a maxed up hint of one, I see that, you know, the query is just much more efficient. Well, I now want to increase my cost threshold to a higher value and make it 40. So Jonathan kind of steps you through that whole process of, all right, yes, increase it to a higher number, kind of monitor the system, and then to fine tune, you want to dig through the, the, the plan cache, look at those queries and see, you know, is that truly the best value? And I will tell you, I know of uh, other consultants that work for you know, large companies, and I've seen as high as 250 as the uh, base cost threshold for parallelism. So it really all depends on your environment, your workload, uh, a thing to mention with the max degree of parallelism, there are applications out there that will require you to set max stop equals one, uh, things like SharePoint. Um, in those cases, you know, follow your, your vendor's recommendation. And if you're seeing really weird behavior, reach out to somebody and, and see if we, we can't help. But um, max stop for the most part, unless it's a vendor recommendation, you want to uh, set it to, to something other than zero on those large physical machines. All right, another fun one, TempDB. Uh, this one's always fun to come across. And with TempDB, um, some unique characteristics. It's recreated at startup. So every time SQL Server service is restarted, TempDB is recreated. You only have one TempDB per instance. It is modeled after the model database, meaning if you haven't resized TempDB when it's restarted, it's a meg or so auto grow for the data file by one meg, your file by 10%. That is for SQL Server 2014 and below. 2016 changed things. We'll talk about that in a moment. A good trivia question. It's also a good interview question. Get your candidate to start talking about TempDB and how important it is, what, what uses TempDB, and then ask, how often should TempDB be backed up? Well, you really can't. Uh, of course, people argue, well, I can take a snapshot of it. I can do things. Well, try to run the backup database TempDB to disk statement, and it will blow up. So that's just a neat Jeopardy question. So considerations with TempDB. With eight cores or less, you want to create equal size data files per the number of cores. There's some older blog post out there that says one file per core. Um, and you know, there was no restriction. You would find people creating 64 
for 10 DB data files, 120 DB data files. I've heard of legit cases where you need you know that large of a number for contention, but for the most part, we don't. So if you have eight cores or less, equal size data files per the number of cores. That's because tempdb uses the proportional fill uh, method. So equal size so that they all get abused equally. With eight or more cores, you want to start with eight equal size data files and increase by four files based upon contention. There is a uh, support article here for contention. Why this is kind of important is uh, your PFS page is page one, your GAM page two, SGAM page three. PFS repeats every 64 meg within the file, but your GAM and SGAM repeat every four gigabytes. So until that data file grows above four gig, you have a single GAM and SGAM page and very few PFS pages. So you'll see contention on those three. By creating multiple files, so let's say we have a four vCPU machine, we have four tempdb data files. Let's say they're only uh, 60 or 50 meg in size. Well, that would give us four PFS, four GAM and four SGAM pages. So that helps with contention on those three pages. Other things for um, tempdb, you want to enable trace flag 1118 always on 2016 and above. That uh, trace flag behavior is on by default. And that says when an extent is created, create all eight pages at the same time. So for 2014 and below, you want to make sure 1118 is on. There's another trace flag 1117 that says um, when a data file has to grow, grow all files at the same time. That's an instance level setting. So we don't recommend that um, you always enable that one because you could have other data uh, databases that have multiple files within a file group. They'll take on that behavior too. So unless you're in that level of behavior that tempdb needs it, we, we say don't turn it on because it can have other impacts to the instance. For 2016 and above, that behavior for trace flag 1117 is on for tempdb by default, which is great because it's just on for tempdb. Other considerations, if you have a really, really busy tempdb, you're generating lots of IO, you could consider placing the data files on separate disk with faster IO if needed. Tempdb is not always the most IO intensive database. So if you have limited SSD uh, storage, it may be that tempdb is not the best to go on that. Maybe you need um, a, another data file, log file, something else to utilize that faster IO. Also consider enabling instant file initialization so that when tempdb creates and you have all those data files that you know, they zero out um, immediately and you don't have to wait for zero initialization. initialization. SQL Server 2016 prompts you so you can check the box to enable instant file initialization during installation which is fantastic. Otherwise, it's a security policy for the perform volume maintenance task. You wanna add the SQL Server service camp there. And so I mentioned um, for the considerations, so when you install SQL Server 2016 and above, when you get to uh, installing the engine portion to tempdb, it will prompt you to create multiple files based upon the number of uh, logical processors that SQL Server sees and the auto growth is no longer one megabyte. I believe it now is still 64 meg for uh, the log and data files, which 64 megabytes is better than one megabyte, but depending on your environment, 64 megs may still be way small and you want to increase that to a much larger you know, number. I've seen some be you know, gigabytes in size. So again, it all depends on your, your workload, your, your environment and so forth. All right. SQL Server agent alerts. I mentioned in the overview slide about free SQL Server monitoring, and this is kind of it. I mean, it, it is limited, um, so you're not going to get a ton of bells and whistles, but it is very, very important that if you're not running a third-party tool that's monitoring for these fatal errors for you, enable SQL Server agent alerts. All you need is database mail. Uh, you should already have mail enabled so that you're getting notifications if you're Check to B job, your backup jobs, your index optimize, all those jobs fail. You want to know about those without having to go and manually check on a daily basis. So mail should already be enabled. So then you can create a mail operator to send the alerts to. So I recommend a distribution group, you know, not just yourself. You may take a holiday. Who is someone else that can get notified of these fatal errors and be able to you know, help you out? So maybe the DBA team, the IT team someone else. So your agent alerts, errors 19 through 25 are all fatal alerts. 
This means something very, very bad happened and whatever transaction was in process at that time that encountered the error is rolled back. Error 825 is related to an IO operation retry. It means that SQL Server tried to write to disk. It couldn't, it tried again, and at some interval of the retry, it was successful. So, hey, great, the data still got written to disk, but it should always get written to disk. It shouldn't have to retry. So this can be can indicate that there's a uh, IO subsystem problem you know, on, on the rise. So if that occurs, immediately notify your storage admin to say, this bad thing happened, figure out what happened. Um, so you can create your agent alerts using the GUI or a T-SQL script. If you use the GUI and you go through all the checkboxes, right before you say OK to create, choose the script to new window, copy and save that script, and now that's part of your SQL Server build. So you can apply that to all your other servers and any new servers that you create. So uh, again, database mail happen. There's a document process step-by-step. -step. All you gotta do is change the email operator um, at this bit.ly link and it will create your errors 19, 19 through 25, your 825. Glenn Berry also has a blog post out there on doing this exact same thing as well. And a lot of the community have kind of added to the list of, oh, here's another error that you should add for different versions, what the different errors mean. The bit.ly link on the screen also includes, uh, or it's a uh, performance article. And the article just after that one um, for me is, what are errors 19 through 25? What do they mean? And what do you do to fix them? And unfortunately, just about every one of them is you're restoring from backup. So it's some fatal corruption level um, that's just really bad news. All right. And we have uh, another fun one is power savings. So power savings, is, it's a good thing. I mean, we need to be environmentally friendly, right? I mean, we don't need to just continue to burn power and... Many of us, we go on flights and we take trips and we have laptops that we would like for the batteries to last forever, our phones. I think one of the, the biggest things to have helped the generation coming up, like my kids, on being more uh, conservation of, of power was Pokemon Go. So the low power mode in that, or that game so that their battery wouldn't die in two hours of them playing Pokemon. All right, so our servers, our laptops, all come with balanced power enabled. So that means that when it comes unplugged, the screen dims, the CPU will run at a slower speed, you know, the hard drive will you know, go into idle if it's not being used after so many minutes, and that helps save the batteries, and that's fantastic. The, the problem in data centers is if your SQL server has balanced power enabled, so either power management within the BIOS, balanced power within the operating system, it can, can dumb down the, your CPUs. So you may have a 2.8 gigahertz processor and it will idle it down to say 800 uh, megahertz. So you're going from a 2018 technology processor speed to something in the late 90s, early 2000s. And those processors cost you know, thousands or thousands of dollars depending on you know, the processor that you select. So now we're gonna take that $10,000 processor and have it running like a $200 chip. But for some applications, that behavior is okay because as soon as a workload comes in, CPU ramps up and you know, it does its thing and it's it, okay. But for SQL Server, it's not conducive to that type of behavior. So it makes bad things happen. And I've seen, I've had clients reach out, hey, we upgraded hardware. Um, you, it's, you know, we literally just demotioned from one machine over to another, or we did some type of, uh, it was boot from sand, we just replaced the blade with a, a faster one and things are just horrible. Now CPU spiked to 100%, can you help? And we take a look and it's like, oh, well you need to disable power savings in the BIOS. They do that and then boom, they're back to 20% CPU or you know, they, they upgraded, it's a new machine, OS, everything, and balance power is enabled within the operating system and they just flip the switch and immediately things go back to normal. So it's a real problem. Uh, it's becoming less and less of a problem because now VMware and uh, other vendors are noticing this, your Cisco UCS, all of those, and there's documentation on, yes, for you know, high um, OLTP workloads like SQL Server, you want to make sure that balance power is turned off and VM admins are turning off um, the power management and BIOS and things, so it's becoming less, but we still see it quite often. 
There is a free tool, CPU-Z. You can get it from cpuid.com. Uh, download just the executable right on your machine and it will show you what the current clock speed is in use. So if you see that the, the processor is a 2.8 gigahertz and you're running at 900 megahertz, you have a problem. Um, and then power savings can also do other things like turning network interface cards off, which is quite problematic if your SQL Server just kind of disconnects from the network. So uh, food for thought, things to think about, uh, common things that I see out there. So my my kind of tagline is, you know, SQL Server is great, but a next, next, next finish install is not good. There's, for many people, they can install SQL Server, create a database, start pushing data into it, and it works fantastically well for a long period of time. But they're going to hit some tipping point where performance just degrades. And out of going through and, and doing a lot of these common fixes, you can get quite a bit of life, you know, out of that instance again without having to do really hardcore your tuning. So you want to make sure first and foremost that you have proper backups to meet your recovery needs, that you're running regular consistency checks. So when corruption occurs, you can be notified of it as quickly as possible and uh, take action. Perform your log cleanups for MSDB and your SQL Server log. You want to make sure that statistics are being updated so that the query optimizer has the best chance possible of generating the most of, or the good enough plan. Proper index maintenance. Uh, memory settings, you want to make sure you have a, a max server memory value so SQL Server doesn't starve the OS. Configure max stop and cost threshold for parallelism for your instance based upon your workload and uh, VC, or core counts. Configure tempdb for your instance. Take advantage of the free SQL Server agent alerts. And lastly, turn off any power savings. Again, it's fantastic for your tablets and your laptops, but not your, your data center server. So I want to thank you all for coming out. Uh, giving of your, your lunch hour to learn more about SQL Server. And if you have any questions, I know there were probably may have been some asked in the, the window. We can try to get to some of those. If not, I'll get the list sent to me and I'll email a response out to everyone. And you can also reach out to me directly, uh, Twitter at T Radney, Tim at SQLSkills.com. Um, and thank you all. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I got a couple of questions that will probably be good for you. Sorry, I meant to get them while you were talking about the topic. Um, got one here from asking if they does setting the power setting on a VM make any difference since it's different than a on premise uh, server? Yeah, so if um, more there on the uh, the physical host. So if the host, because once you're in the hypervisor, it can be doing some really gnarly things where it may be idling down the CPU, and you're not actually seeing that. So uh, for all of my my customers on VMware Hyper-V, I strongly encourage them to uh, talk to their uh, virtualization engineers and disable any power savings in the BIOS. That one is it, a little bit harder to uh, to pinpoint and troubleshoot, but there are things that you can derive from um, from within vSphere. Mm. Um, but if they need more on that, uh, they can email me directly and I can follow up with more detail. Cool, cool. Uh, we have a question here they might enjoy. What is the best way to shrink TempDB? <laughs> yes. Re restart the instance. No. Uh, there, there actually is uh, a couple of legitimate reasons where you, you may need to shrink TempDB. I don't know if this person was being uh, kind of a joke or for real, uh, but you can run a shrink command if TempDB has grown. In cases where TempDB grew and it's on the same disk as the uh, user database files, and one of those is at the point to have to auto grow. Um, previously, there was documentation never shrink TempDB. It could cause corruption. That is not true for modern uh, versions of SQL Server. I forget. I think it's actually 2005 and up. It's okay to shrink. Uh, Paul did a blog post uh, a while back. You can Google that or, or Bing. Um, but the regular shrink command, but many times it won't actually shrink because a portion of it that um, uh, is toward the end of the file that you know, is in use and you just you just can't, but you can uh, clear the buffers and proc cache and things and, and try to shrink in an emergency. But uh, most of the time you just wait till maintenance and restart the instance and resize it properly and uh, find out whoever's causing the, the bad behavior to cause it to grow out of control and uh, try to shrink them. Hmm. Okay, we have a question back at the very start. Um, someone just wants to know, for clarification, does uh, CheckDB cover all other checks like allocation, catalog, file group? Yeah, so it does the allocation. Um, 
the the benefits of the 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 separate commands is if you don't want to run the full check to be against the entire database, you can do individual file groups if you have multiple file groups. If you have uh, if you know the problems just within an allocation map, then you can run just check alloc instead of having to run full check DB. Uh, so that, that's the benefits of the more uh, granular, but yeah, full check DB does the entire gamut, everything. Okay. Um, someone wanted to know uh, if in SQL 2016, is the trace flag 2371 on by default? Two, three. I'm not sure. I'll have to follow up on that one. I know there's a, a, a number of trace flags that are uh, the, the behavior's on by default in 2016. I would have to confirm. Yeah, that, that, that's no problem. Like, uh, Okay, this is kind of interesting enough. Um, so somebody's asking, uh, by default, auto-update statistics are turned on. Are you suggesting that we, instead of leaving that SQL Server to update statistics based on its 20% plus 500 rows changed, we need to update the statistics based on when the plan isn't good? Um, I, I kind of think this is a case of, there's a slight mix up between the ascending key problem and just the update statistics, but it'd be nice to get your opinion on it. Yeah, so the, the auto-update statistics value, there is a trace flag you can turn on to de decrease that. We we always recommend leave auto update statistics uh, on as kind of a, a, a safety net, but you need to be updating statistics manually yourself much more frequently. So it's not a, hey, wait until I have a problem, update statistics. You want to, on a regular basis, whether that be you know, daily or weekly, to run a update statistics um, process. So with my clients, when I implement Ola Halligren's solution, if, I, if they have a, a maintenance window where we can run that nightly, then there's fragmentation is being taken care of in any um, tables that had or, or any data that had row modifications, statistics will be updated for, for that as well. I'm hoping in a future release of SQL Server, we will see the ability to update statistics based upon percentage of data change so that we hmm. can have it more granular. So, okay, once you know, 3%, 5% of the, the data has had modifications, update statistics, but not on a, a billion row table, if one if there's been one record change, that that bit has been flipped, and now uh, update statistics, you know, would would want to run uh, with you know Ola's process or any other process that's doing a um, uh, where there's been row modification. So whether one bit or a, or one row or a a million rows, it, it it sees no difference. So we're hoping that we'll see something where it can be much more grain or uh, robust where it's percentage based, but no, I, I do not recommend waiting until you have problems or you're seeing erratic behavior to update stats. I mean, it, there, there's no real justification there. Update them more frequently as data is being changed. You want to update statistics. Uh, yeah, that's fair enough. I suppose I'm going off that. There is another question here on, um, so let me just find it again. There's quite a few coming in. Uh, yeah. Going off that, there is a question on what should the ideal percentage be to decide whether to index reorganize or index rebuild? So going from statistics to indexes. Okay, so this has been kind of, there, there's some data that's been put out and uh, I think Paul Randall was one of the ones that was you know, asked, what are the values? And it's based on his experience you know, between if it's, over 10% less than three are reorganize, over 30% you know, rebuild. And that's pretty well become the industry standard. Um, I've seen a lot of third party tools and, and custom scripts out there that say five to 30, you know, reorganize, over 30, rebuild. And the consistent thing has been over 30%. And I think that's been you know, tested and validated and, and you know, people trying to see is that still really the the, the best value? and for the most part, I mean, it, it's checked out. You know, once you get over 30%, just the overall cost for the reorganization and time versus just rebuilding, you know, makes sense to rebuild. A difference comes in, depending on your version of SQL Server, a rebuild could be an online operation or an offline operation. If you're Enterprise Edition, it's an online operation. Well, if I'm Standard Edition, I'm 24 by 7, I really can't take the hit to do rebuilds and have, you know, indexes go offline. So I'm going to reorg 
you know, always, and I'm going to generate a ton of transaction log, but you know, that's the best thing for my system to keep, you know, be the less invasive. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, five to 30 is the, the reorganization threshold and over 30% is the, the rebuild. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Um, well, we still have like double digits of questions. So do you mind if I ask you like one or two more and then we'll just send the questions on to you to answer yourself? Yeah. Um, so we do have one asking, um, uh, how frequently would you recommend running a full check DB? I recommend no longer than once a, once a week. So full check DB, you know, once a week. Reason being is you know, most of the, the people I come across, they're keeping backup files for two weeks, 14 days. So think about the the logic through there. If we're running CheckDB on Saturdays, we're running full backups on you know, Sunday. So I run CheckDB on Saturday. I have a backup on uh, you know, Sunday. I'm not running CheckDB again until the following Saturday. Well, that Saturday it runs. It has you know, problems. You know, detected corruption. I'm on vacation that week, so I'm not seeing the, the CheckDB failed. I come in from vacation on Monday. I have a flood of emails. You know, a week's worth that I'm going through. It may be the following Tuesday, Wednesday before I notice, oh my gosh, we had corruption on the database. Well, from the time that it, it ran, the retention been a full week before corruption determined, found I'm on vacation for a week, come back. I try to go back to the Sunday backup from two weeks ago and what do you know, the corruption's there and I don't have a backup further, you know, further past it. Um, so that's kind of the, the risk here is you wanna make sure that your backup retention allows you to be able to go back prior to the corruption in just about all circumstances. So if you're the, the lonely DBA, you need more than two weeks of backup retention, at least for when you're gonna be out of the office for an extended period of time. So once a week minimum, I have some clients, like I said, they're, they're small systems, they have the IO, we, the job runs on a, on a daily basis, but at the, the minimum, I like to see um, once, a, once a week. Folks that are doing it once a month, I mean, that's super risky because then you, you know, your, your backup retention. Uh, I've worked with too many clients where they don't have a backup, they have corruption, and w we can't do anything for them. And that's that's a very hard news to deliver to to a customer. Um, okay, I, I think I'll leave it to the final one just because I want people to you know, go and enjoy what lunch break they have left. Um, this person does ask that sometimes they will rebuild indexes and it doesn't resolve fragmentation for a large table. And they just want to know what could the possible reasons be? I would need to know more about the tables, but I mean, certain data types could, could be uh, interfering. Um, that would be the only thing that's really coming to, to mind would be you know, certain data types. Yep, that that's no problem. Um, like <laughs> you can't really make a like un I suppose informed or a misinformed opinion when you don't have the information. So that's fair enough. Um, okay, and that I think is around it. We do have a lot more questions, and they're still coming in, but we're also getting a lot of the thank yous. And when I get, let's say, more than twenty of them, I realize okay, I think people are leaving. So thanks a lot right. for that, Tim. <laughs> um. I'm not sure if uh, Steve is on the line, he normally takes over, but if not, I will just get the slides up here. Um, but I do want to say thank you so much for coming on and giving the presentation, and sharing your knowledge. It's really great to get that, especially from someone as knowledgeable as yourself. All right, well, thank you so much. And again, anyone that wants to email directly to, with questions, they can feel free. I'll, I I am online. It it was it was great, and I probably wouldn't be able to show my screen anyway. <laughs> I'll forget it or something. So anyway, thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for having me.